dress. And it adds a really nice creaminess too. And then I'm gonna add half of an avocado. This is also to help with that creaminess. And also avocados are full of good fat. And then I'll put a little bit of real maple syrup in. And then finally, I'm going to add some full fat coconut milk. So these fats are great to feel satisfied. You wanna have fat in your smoothie because it will really satisfy your belly. So we'll put in this whole amount here. Now that looks nice and creamy, but I really think I need to taste test it to make sure it's perfect. Let's see if it's chocolatey enough for me. Mmm, so good. That is really, really delicious. I like serving this smoothie for dessert, so let's have a little fun with this. I'm gonna rim it with some coconut and I'll show you how to make the coconut flakes stick. So you just take a little bit of lemon, you wanna put the lemon juice around the top of the cup, and then put it into some coconut shreds. Just like that. Okay, that's perfect. We'll do the other glass. You could also toast your coconut too uh, in the oven just for like under 10 minutes and it makes the coconut nice and sweet and crunchy too. Okay, there we go. All right, let's pour our smoothie into our cups. Oh, look at that. So thick and creamy. And let's top it with some little raw cacao nibs on each for some crunch and a few sprigs of mint because it's always nice to eat food that looks pretty and I'm going to taste test it again. This is CBC Here and Now. We've been sideswiped. Getting federal money for summer students hasn't been a problem till now. If we ticked it, we would be false. We would be lying. A high profile lawyer is locked up after his third drunk driving conviction. Mr. Brace should be treated no more harshly, but also no more leniently than any other individual. Investing in health research saves lives. Mon researchers make the grade. It gives me um, much, much pride in, in, in our university and the things that we do. Well, the big warm up today, the big freeze up tonight and through tomorrow across the island. Temperatures are really going to drop. Lots of ice on the menu for the island. The snow tapers to, fl to flurries in Labrador. I've got your forecast coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain, live from Memorial University's Medical School. The federal government today announced millions of dollars for medical research. I'm going to introduce you to two people who really hope the grants they receive today are going to help people in our province. That's coming up later on Here and Now. But first, back to you, Debbie, with our top news stories. Thanks so much, Anthony. Well, a change in the application process for a federal student employment program has put some religious groups in a tough spot. They must now check a box on the application form that says their core mandate respects the Charter of Rights and women's reproductive rights. Here now is Carolyn Stokes reports. During the summer months, these glass cases at the Basilica Museum hold pieces of the province's history, religious artifacts that are on display for locals and tourists. But these doors can't open without the help of student employees who are hired using government funding. First thing they do is they come and they take the items out safely and put them out for display. 
After that task, the 8 to 12 students mainly work as tour guides, describing the history of the artifacts and of the building. If we didn't have these students, we can't share this building this summer. And right now, the Archdiocese can't submit the form needed to get those students because of this one little box. To get the funding, the Archdiocese must affirm that its core mandate respects the Charter of Rights and reproductive rights, the right of a woman to have an abortion. We are pro-life. We, 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 we are opposed to abortion. That's a part of our core mandates. Everyone in the country knows what our core mandate is. If we ticked it, we would be false we would be lying. So we simply can't do it. It looks like the government is trying to impose the, their views on us and other religious organizations, other churches. And by doing that, Monsignor Frank Puddister feels government is actually infringing on their rights. Freedom of religion, freedom of worship, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience. He says the student employees won't be promoting religion, just explaining history. The role they have is, 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 is non-religious. They're not promoting our values. Problem is, Federal Employment Minister Patty Haidu has a different interpretation of what core mandate means. This is about the activities of the organization and the job description. This is not about beliefs or values. By that interpretation, the Archdiocese should have no problem ticking the box and getting the grant. But that's not going to happen. The government sh should have worded the application forms differently and to be very focused and specific. We've been sideswiped in all of this, I think. Sideswiped and at a standstill. Monsignor Puddister sees only one way forward. Uh, I would like to see a new application form issued by the government with these parts removed so that we can apply for grants the way we always have. Whether or not that happens is up to the federal government. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. A well-known defense lawyer is in jail tonight. Jeff Brace was sentenced today for his latest impaired driving conviction. Here now is Peter Cowan explains. Jeff Brace walked in today dressed not for court, but for jail. This is his third conviction for drinking and driving. He knew he'd have a prison sentence. The court heard how in December 2016, Brace fell over on his motorcycle on Kenmount Road. An officer saw him and noticed he looked impaired. He blew .220, almost three times the legal limit. It was 11.30 in the morning. I knew my readings were high, he told the court. I hadn't stopped from the night before. The Crown and Defense agreed to a sentence, 75 days in jail, a three-year driving prohibition, and a year of probation that includes counseling. I'd like to apologize for my stupidity, Brace told the court, saying he was careless and reckless. I'm not looking for pity. I don't deserve it, frankly. Brace says he gave up drinking in 2012, but started drinking again to deal with a difficult situation involving his youngest daughter. The Crown hopes that jail time sends a message to more than just Brace. Other people who drink and drive know that there's a possibility that you're going to go to jail. Uh, and, you know, everything that has follows from that, you know, it impacts your family life, your career. So, you know, people have to stop drinking and driving. Brace was led away in handcuffs just like any other person convicted of a crime. And the Crown insists Brace's job as a lawyer and his high profile didn't affect the sentence. Mr. Brace should be treated no more harshly, but also no more leniently than any other individual. Brace told the court he's been getting counseling for his addiction to alcohol and plans to continue that when he's released. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. A 23-year-old is going to jail for 15 months for his role in a highway crash that killed another man. Sheldon Gray of Shoe Cove pleaded guilty to dangerous driving causing death. An initial charge of impaired driving causing death was withdrawn after the guilty plea was entered. The accident happened on the highway near La Cie on July 1, 2016. The vehicle went off the road and struck an embankment, injuring Gray and killing his 25-year-old passenger. The RCMP said speed and alcohol were factors in the crash. When he gets out of jail, Gray won't be allowed to drive for four years. Well, despite the rain and mild temperatures today, the land on a residential road in Deer Lake did not shift. The sandy edge of Pine Tree Road has been slipping into the Humber River. Mild temperatures of up to seven degrees today made for a slippery road, but the land there did not move. Residents believe their properties are safe for now, but nearby water and sewer pipes are just feet away from where erosion has taken place. 
Crews spent the afternoon moving power and internet lines to the opposite side of the street. So Ryan, uh, you've been keeping an eye on the water levels on the mighty Humber. What, what's the story? Well, good news, really, that uh, no big dramatic rise today. And I know that it may take a little bit of time for, of course, the, the creeks and the rivers and the streams, that is, to run into the Humber. Uh, but today, rainfall amounts uh, were really only in the 5 to 15 millimeter range. So some good news there, a little bit lower on the lower end of some of those ranges we were talking about. Temperatures, yes, did get to that seven, even eight degree range. But as we zoom in and take a look at the levels along the Humber over the last 24 hours or so, uh, first starting in Reedville, again, some fluctuation here at Reedville, but uh, overall not a dramatic rise. And certainly uh, the latest trend has been downward, which is good. Come down to the Deer Lake generating station. You can certainly see where the downward trend has stalled a little bit, kind of leveling off, and we'll certainly be keeping an eye on this. But again, nothing alarming here uh, over the last uh, 24 hours or so. And down towards the Humber Bridge, uh, this is down closer to Steadybrook, and you can see where, again, things have leveled off. Not quite that drop that we were seeing, but nothing to be too alarmed about here. Of course, we'll be keeping a close eye on this over the next 24 hours as uh, those creeks and streams do run into the Humber. But uh, we'll keep you posted on that, and we'll talk about your full weather forecast, which includes a big cool down. Not just for the West Coast, but right across the island. The details are coming up, Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, cutting edge research at Memorial University was given a boost today. The Federal Minister of Health was in town to make the announcement. And my co-host, Anthony Germain, spent most of the day at the Munn Medical School. That's where we've reached him now. Anthony, how much money are we talking about? Well, coming up in just a bit, Debbie, I'm going to introduce you to two researchers who are big beneficiaries of today's announcement. And they're going to tell us exactly how they hope this funding is going to help them crack some of the mysteries of the illnesses that they research. But we're talking to answer your question. We're talking about $2 million as coming right here to researchers at Memorial University. And the federal minister says new money means new jobs and new hope. Investing in health research today leads to long term cost savings in the future. But most importantly, investing in health research saves lives. This investment will be used to support over 500 cutting edge research projects leading to new treatment, scientific breakthroughs and creating new knowledge that is at the core of health advances. Some very interesting science to tell you about later on here and now. Two researchers who are looking at two very different types of illnesses who really hope that today's announcement means down the road, their science is going to help people. Well, thanks very much to Anthony. We'll be back to him shortly. Well, the people of Northern Arm have spoken and they said no. Three quarters of eligible voters cast their ballots last night and they voted against amalgamating with nearby Botwood, 136 to 66. These results are not binding, but they clearly tell council how a majority of people feel. There's another municipal move to tell you about. The province has given the go-ahead for the local service district of Georges Brook Milton to incorporate and become a town. That means the community of about 800 near Clarenville will be able to access more money from governments for infrastructure projects. To Labrador now, where caribou are once again a point of contention. Nunatsiavut is asking the province to enforce the five-year-old ban on hunting caribou in the big land. And that's because the Innu nation says it is going to hunt the animal. And it's pulled out of the indigenous management plan for the George River herd. Land Resources Minister Jerry Byrne won't say whether the province will strictly enforce the ban. He says they'll continue to monitor hunting there, but with such Earlier a large this month, land mass enforcement isn't the full solution. What will provide a better result is for all those that have a stake in this to feel part of this, but as well to be active participating in self-discipline, self-regulation, self, self and, 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 and adjusting hunting behaviors. To the Ann Norris murder trial now, where today the jury watched more than three hours of video of Norris from May of 2016. Here now's Glenn Payette explains. 
On May 8, 2016, Ann Norris went into the Walmart on Topsail Road. There, she ends up buying a yellow-handled hammer. She would admit she used it to kill Marcel Reardon the next day. Then, on May 13, four days after she killed Reardon, Norris goes back to the same Walmart and takes her time selecting hammers, trying them out in the air. Apparently not satisfied, she goes back and gets another hammer. By now, the police have her under surveillance and make an arrest at the store. Norris has admitted to killing Reardon, but says she is not criminally responsible because of a mental disorder at the time. Tomorrow, one of Norris's lawyers, Rosellen Sullivan, will cross-examine the lead investigator on the case, Constable Ryan Pittman. Glenn Payette, CBC News. St. John's. Canada's highest honor today for Con River Mi'kmaq Chief Michel Joe. He was awarded the Order of Canada in Ottawa by Governor General Julie Payette. A revered national Mi'kmaq Gary, spiritual leader nothing. and an authority on traditional medicines and healing practices, he's deeply committed to keeping its people's roots alive. Mr. Joe. Chief Joe was recognized for his long-standing work preserving the language, cultures and tradition of his people. For more than three decades, he's been an ambassador for the Mi'kmaq as well. As the announcer said today, he's inspired his community to grow from a place of isolation to one of prosperity. This is one of the largest single investments in health research that our government will be making this year. Some of it is going to research at MUN that may make a difference in your life. That's coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm live at Memorial University's Medical School where there was a major funding announcement for scientific health research today. $2 million is coming to Memorial University to three researchers, but two of those that I want to introduce you to, one of them is focusing on multiple sclerosis. And I was surprised to find out that Canada, among countries in the world, has more cases per capita of MS than any other country. And here's the kicker. The Atlantic region has more cases than any other part of Canada. And one of the doctors I spoke to, Dr. Craig Moore, he hopes to change that. He's one of the people who received $600,000 today, and he hopes someday his science is going to make a difference. Dr. Moore, MS, a very serious illness. Uh, a lot of people have seen what it does to people. What's the gist of your research? So here at Memorial University, we've just uh, recently in the last couple of years uh, started developing a longitudinal uh, database of the MS patients in this province. This is the first time this, this has ever been done to this extent in the province. Mm -hmm. And over the past couple of years, we've been collecting uh, clinical specimens from these patients, mostly their blood and serum. And we've built up kind of a data, uh, a data bank of, of these uh, materials. And we're finally ready to put them to use okay, so when um, you with this research. When you say put them to use, what does that mean in, in language most people can understand? So MS is an immune mediated condition so it's where the immune system actually attacks part of the brain and, and uh, spinal cord so we what we do need to understand better is how immune cells uh, target these organs and target the myelin which is the important factor the fatty substance that insulates the insulates the brain and spinal cord and we really need to understand how these cells are leading to both mechanisms of damage but also immune cells and inflammation can also be viewed as a good thing too and can promote repair. And what we really need to do in MS is to learn how the brain will repair itself. So as part of this looking at uh, a, a defense within the brain against those cause, the things that cause MS? Not necessarily a defense, but more of a reaction. So we don't necessarily know if we can necessarily stop uh, the immune attack in the brain but what we do think that we can be confident in is that we can change the way that the brain itself responds to the inflammation so it can choose to respond negatively and, mm -hmm. re and result in the symptoms that we know classically come with MS or potentially in another manner that actually would potentially lead to repair and, and good symptom management. What kind of toll does MS take on people who are afflicted with it? MS is very heterogeneous, meaning it's uh, a very mixed disease. No two individuals diagnosed with MS have the exact same symptomology. This is a very uh, this is very taxing for clinicians in being able to diagnose the disease and the different subtypes of the disease um, that come with a diagnosis. It's essentially uh, at this point in time impossible to know the disease trajectory and whether a patient will be stable in ten. To five, right. five to ten years, or whether they could be wheelchair bound. So you're the recipient of several hundred thousand dollars to yeah. assist your research. At the end of the five years, what do you hope to have accomplished? What I hope to accomplish is to make a regional, national, and international um, uh, contribution to understanding the disease mechanisms of multiple sclerosis, and hopefully to identify better uh, therapeutic targets for patients suffering from this disease. All right, well, doctor, congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. One of the other big winners to today's announcements was Dr. Francis Bambico. He studies post-traumatic stress disorder as well as depression, and he wants to get a better understanding of those two illnesses, and he hopes that his research might actually prevent people from killing themselves. Dr. Bambico, congratulations. Thank you very much. So what will these funds mean for your particular research into PTSD and depression? It's, it's certainly going to uh, boost uh, the, the, the capacities, the capabilities of the lab to be able to do more research into the nature of these disorders, uh, depression and PTSD, and be able to eventually develop, identify uh, ways to be able to develop uh, novel treatment approaches that are much better than mm -hmm. what we could currently have. Now in our news time. program here and now, we've spent a lot of time covering right. suicide of late. Yeah. PTSD and depression often linked as causal factors. What are your hopes for what your research will accomplish? Yes, it's, uh, this is suicide has always been associated with depression and PTSD, and we hope to accomplish to, mi to minimize the, uh, uh, the incidences of suicide. Because uh, the, uh, one of the, the pressing issues uh, with depression, for instance, is that um, the drugs that are available to treat depression, antidepressants, take a long time before the benefits kick in, before the therapeutic effects kick in. So you have to, have, for instance, admin, uh, religiously uh, take 
the drug for at least a month before you experience the, right. the benefits. And for people who have who are suicidal, that's not you know it's it's, it's alarming for them because too much time. Too much time, like uh, yeah. before so getting the benefits, like they have, they will have killed themselves so prematurely. So specifically, you have people who suffer from depression, mm -hmm. others who suffer from post traumatic, post -traumatic stress, disorder. stress disorder. We don't fully understand why some people get it and get some it, people yeah. do not. So yeah. are you looking at brain chemistry? We're looking at brain chemistry and um, the chemical processes, the molecular processes that occur within neurons, within brain cells associated with these disorders. Okay, yeah. so best case and scenario, at the end of this research period in five years, what would your, what, was, what does success look like? Success look like uh, what what success uh, looks like is uh, eventually be able to identify some uh, proteins or some molecules inside these uh, neurons that we can actually target using new drugs, and that will give more effective uh, uh, outcomes in terms of treatment right. for depression. No, a lot of yeah. people don't realize how competitive it is to actually yeah. get this yeah. kind of funding. Right. What was your reaction when you found out that okay, Dr. Bambico gets the cash? Of course, at first, it's, I couldn't believe it because that's like the, the, the success rate is pretty um, minimal, very minuscule. Uh, it's uh, just now that it's starting to seep, seep in. <laughs> it's yeah. still, you know, so until uh, so when they told me about it, uh, I was, of course, overjoyed and I like, went out with friends and celebrated. Um, but it's just now that, you know, I'm <laughs> getting into that. Yeah. So, but it's also, it also gives me um, much, much pride in, in, in our university and the things that we do and gives me more, uh, stimulates, uh, it motivates me a lot to like um, do more for the future, uh, engage in research that is, is going to be helpful to our society. Yeah, and if you're a medical scientist, this is you know this is what's it all about. It's all about this, yeah, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of celebrating here at Mun today. Two million dollars here, almost three hundred and fifty million dollars across the country. What guarantee is there that any of this research will actually pay off? I'm going to put that question to the federal health minister later on here and now. NAFTA talks this week could spell the last days for the Cornerbrook paper mill's famous whistle. U.S. newsprint tariffs threaten the mill's future.
forecast has been brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Welcome back to Here and Now. And you know, Ryan, the weather can really point out to us how big this province is. Labrador, completely different than most of the island today. Yeah, for sure. We did see a mix uh, transition to some rain in the extreme southeast of Labrador, but primarily this has been a snow and wind event. And uh, love to hear, of course, from everybody in Labrador. And Ken Nelson in Northwest River says, bit of snow here today. <laughs> I love that the hummingbird's still coming to the window. Uh, <laughs> nice little uh, decoration there. Uh, thanks to Ken. By the way, about 15 centimeters in through Happy Valley Goose Bay and that uh, neck of the woods today in the upper Lake Melville region. We still do have winter storm warnings in effect. Uh, Labrador City uh, as of 4 o'clock around 19 centimeters there. McCovic around 10 centimeters, but the worst is yet, yet to come for that coast of Labrador where blizzard warnings are still in effect. Uh, we are talking about another 20 to 30 centimeters on the way. Hopedale down through McCovic. We'll show you the snowfall map in a minute. Wind warnings are still in effect for Clarenville, Bonavista, and the Avalon Peninsula with some potential to see some gusts upwards of 100 kilometers per hour over the next couple of hours. It's 8 degrees right now in St. John's. It's 0 in Cornerbrook, minus 1 in Stephenville as the colder air wraps back in on the other side of the system. Of course, the main story becomes from the warm-up today to the freeze-up tomorrow, and there's going to be a ton of ice on the go across Newfoundland by the time we get to tomorrow, even the morning, but especially the afternoon in the east. Uh, sustained winds near 50 in St. John's right now, gusting closer to 60, and we are going to be seeing those gusts in the along the coast of Labrador continue to ramp up. 72 right now in name, gusting closer to 100 through the overnight and into tomorrow morning. There's the low, which again, you can see that rain is departing from the Avalon. We're seeing this drier punch come in behind, but it's a cooler air mass coming in on the other side of this system as this low spins up counterclockwise and continues to move to the north. Watch your timeline in terms of the temperatures through the overnight tonight. There's 11 p.m. just starting to drop uh, closer to the freezing mark in St. John's. And by the time we get to tomorrow morning, we are well below freezing for most of the region. Uh, still just getting the freezing mark across uh, St. John's and note temperatures tomorrow morning uh, will continue to fall for St. John's. This is the next 24 hours. Potential for some icing even through the overnight, but the best chance of some of that black ice forming will be early tomorrow morning and then especially through the commute. So do keep that in mind that there will be some slippery spots even for tomorrow morning, but especially into the afternoon as any of that standing water does freeze up. So your morning outlook well below freezing for central western Newfoundland. Happy about the Goose Bay at minus five, Nain at minus eight. Temperatures are going to fall or stall for most of us tomorrow. As that cold air continues to wrap in, we'll bottom out in the morning, recover a little bit into the afternoon, but generally temperatures stalling in central parts of Newfoundland along the west coast as well, falling in through Labrador and falling here across the uh, Avalon as well. Minus five by home time tomorrow afternoon, the high uh, temperature around uh, minus four degrees winds in from the southwest gusting 60 to 70. There's a chance of flurries tomorrow across the Buren and the Avalon primarily in the morning. Some sun into the afternoon, certainly better chance of some sun and less chance of flurries through central Newfoundland. And of course, onshore flurries develop tonight along the west coast. We're talking about two to five centimeters to start your day by the time uh, to brush off the car tomorrow morning and then another two to five centimeters in those westerlies gusting to 70 through the day tomorrow. Primarily gross more down through Cornerbrook towards Stephenville, uh, but uh, again, all along that west coast, the potential to get into some of those flurries. There's the snow that does continue along the coast of Labrador. Winds will ease through the day, but it's a very stormy day along the coast. Tapering to flurries tonight, Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador City, Churchill Falls, and there's the bullseye over the next 24 hours. Generally Lighter snowfalls, 2 to 5 for uh, Labrador City over the next 24. Happy Valley Goose Bay, 5 to 10, as well as the West Coast. More on your long range right through the weekend. Coming up, Debbie. Thanks again, Ryan. Well, as Canadian and American NAFTA negotiators meet in Montreal, 25 newsprint mills across the country are facing millions in tariffs. This after a Washington company accused Canadian producers of dumping newsprint into the U.S. In Cornerbrook, the mill has been struggling for years. And as here and now's Chris O'Neill Yates discovered, the community fears these tariffs could mean the end of the last paper mill in the province. You can set your clock by the mill whistle in Cornerbrook. 
For almost 100 years, it's marked the start and the end of the workday at the paper mill. That whistle rings at 8 and 4, and everyone knows the time. My 8-year-old says it's 4 o'clock. So it's very much part of the community beyond the economics. You can say one thing about real estate developer Trina Burden. She's not short on optimism. This is my first project. Her plans for a 40-unit condo development and several streets of homes have fallen way behind. Now the Trump administration's new countervailing tariff, more than $8 million a year on paper coming from Cornerbrook, has Burden concerned about who will buy her housing units. The Trump dialogue just absor it's all over. And the way I felt like I was going to be able to survive it was just sort of say, he can't affect me. <laughs> but now it's, it's staring you right in the face. The 10% tariff on Cornerbrook pulp and paper began with a Washington mill who filed a complaint. And it alleges that the loan Newfoundland and Labrador gave the parent company, Kruger, in 2014 was a subsidy. There was no subsidy given to Cornerbrook pulp and paper. Then Premier Tom Marshall announced the $110 million loan with much fanfare. Now in retirement, Marshall emphasizes that it was a loan. We charge interest on the loan. Um, they've been paying interest, is my understanding, since day one. As collateral, Marshall says Deer Lake Power, a $200 million Kruger asset, was put on the table. If they default in payment of principal and interest, you know, the government could take the power plant, sell it, and pay the taxpayers back the amount of the loan. So it was a business transaction, not a subsidy by no means. Over $8 million a year is held in trust until the outcome of an appeal in the U.S., and that could take years. 300 jobs are at stake at the mill. Then there are the hundreds of loggers who cut the wood that is trucked here every day. We've had the uh, struggles the last few years in trying to keep that mill going in Cornerbrook, and with this additional cost, uh, you know, the fair is what, could, what it could lead to. Lindy Vincent was a logger for 25 years. He represents 150 loggers in operations spread across Newfoundland. We've got membership uh, members now in approximately 50, 50 small communities, you know, so it's not all, uh, not all based just in Cornerbrook. What other options have we got left to us? There's a lot of concern from our membership on, this, on, the, on the tariff uh, situation with, with the states and... You know, just, I guess there's a lot of worry. And it's At Grenfell College, Robert Scott teaches his students about sustainability. For Cornerbrook to be sustainable, we need to have a strong economy. Some of these students hope to go on to work in forestry. This could impact the sustainability of Cornerbrook, for sure. If we lose jobs as a result of these tariffs, employment in these spin-off companies uh, could go down as well. I mean, so it could mean that some of our graduates are... are are losing employment. However, the mayor of Cornerbrook is one of the most optimistic people in town that the mill will weather yet another storm. Our mill, uh, on all accounts, is very efficient. Uh, it has a power supply, of course, at Deer Lake Power. Uh, the dollar's been relatively weak over the last number of years. So there's a, f a number of things that have been going in our favor. Neither the company nor the mill workers union is talking. So just what the company plans to do to stay afloat is unclear. But this town has seen bad times before. It's always a struggle. I feel like we've been in survival mode for decades. And over the years, we've certainly seen the operation decrease in size. If that mill goes, then uh, so goes the forest industry in Newfoundland. You know? It's an $8 million a year hit. That's going to hurt. They're trying to survive in a very, very tough, in, tough environment. The start of another day is marked with a comfortably familiar sound. For how long more, nobody knows. That, too, is an all-too-familiar feeling in this pulp and paper town. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Corner Brook. The province signed a deal with Ottawa today and got $72 million in new health care funding. Coming up in 15 minutes, the Federal Minister of Health is going to tell us how that money is going to be spent here in Newfoundland and Labrador.
Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm live at Memorial University's Medical School. The federal health minister was here today to announce some major funding for health care research, but she was also here to meet with the premier and sign a health accord that was agreed to in 2016. So, Minister, what was the significance of your announcement and meeting with Premier Dwight Ball? Well, we were very pleased uh, to be in Newfoundland and St. John's specifically today to sign the bilateral agreements with the province of Newfoundland. This has been uh, long um, in the making, and today we were just very pleased to come and to finally do the official signing ceremony to ensure that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians can get the share of the money with respect to the uh, accord that we signed today. And we're talking about how much funding? I know it was... Yeah, we're talking $72 million over a five-year period, and that is specifically to cover uh, areas of mental health and community health care. Uh, so it's above and beyond the transfers uh, that were done last year. And we're really pleased because this money is going to specifically address the needs that are that we've oftentimes heard that are needed. The Canadians are telling us that the issue of mental health and community health care is an area that oftentimes is underfunded. So this money will certainly allow provinces and territories to put the money where they feel it's needed. And you also made a major funding announcement that certainly got the attention of Memorial University's medical school as well as I think medical schools across the country. Why did you choose St. John's to make this big announcement? Well, I was delighted. First of all, I was in Newfoundland for the signing of the bilateral agreement. And also with this announcement that was pending, I said, why not come to Memorial University? I was thrilled that we have three researchers that have received money to do the research, and they're from Memorial University here. So we just thought it would be really a great opportunity uh, to do the big announcement uh, nationally, but also to showcase the work that's being done here locally. Now, what determines success of a funding program like this? And what I mean by that is some research works, some research doesn't. Um, it's kind of hit and miss. What, what does success look like? at the end of five years of spending hundreds of millions of dollars? If we don't invest, we're never going to know what the results are. So we really want to invest in the brightest minds and the brightest researchers that are, that are, that are available. And when people qualify for CIHR researchers, we know they're the best of the best. So we really want to see what are the outcomes and the many possibilities uh, that they're going to come up with and also solutions to possibly save lives of Canadians. The other thing as well, it's really important to recognize that these jobs and these researchers really contribute to our economy as well. We really want to make sure that we can keep them here in Canada, keep them here in Newfoundland, and Labrador. So it's important to also invest in them for them to come up with the solutions of the many problems that we have. On a slightly different topic, my last question. You're a minister from Atlantic Canada, so I think you might be more sensitive to this. Newfoundland and Labrador, as you know, has a, a, some troubled economy and economic issues right now. Some people think there's a chance the province may go bankrupt. In the event that Newfoundland and Labrador couldn't afford to pay for its medical system and its health care system, what role would there be for the federal government? Well, we were really pleased that last year we were able to sign the Canada Health Transfers with all the provinces uh, and territories. And the announcement that we've made today with the signing of the, bi the bilateral agreement, it's funding that's above and beyond that initial investment. So this money today that we're investing is specifically in the areas that are of concerns to Canadians and concerns to people from your province here. And that will, you know, be able to, to help them with respect to areas of mental health and home and community health care. So together we really want to continue to work in partnerships to support Canadians and to support uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. All right, Madame Petitpa Taylor, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Healthcare still ranks as a number one issue for people in this province, as it does for many people in the country. Some big news today at Memorial University. Obviously, a lot of excitement in the medical community and also some excitement about how many job spinoffs there'll be. So it was a big day here with researchers hoping that their science down the road will really help some people. Debbie? Thanks so much, Anthony. As you say, a very big day for health research at Memorial. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. That's our Anthony Germain, live from medical school at Memorial University. Well, if you have a community mailbox and you were hoping you'd get switched back to home delivery, you're likely out of luck. Julie Van Dusen has that story.
time to introduce our young athlete of the day. This is Jessie Kelly of Winterland. Seven years old, loves to play hockey with the Marystown Miners. Jessie also enjoys soccer, softball, and karate. Congratulations. Congratulations. In stereo. <laughs> Jesse, you're today's young athlete of the day. <laughs> the weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. We forgot Anthony wasn't That's here. Right. So uh, <laughs> we decided to just all do it in unison, yeah. right? Yeah. Jesse got the first uh, in stereo <laughs> shout out. Anyway, back to the weather. There's a lot of the weather on the go, a lot of weather on the go, but uh, I can see your big uh, North America map over there. Yeah, kind of setting the stage for what has been a, a pretty turbulent couple of weeks across eastern parts of North America where the cold air and the warm air have been doing battle. That continues over the next week or so. Signs that maybe a little more winter like into February. We'll talk about that in the coming days, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly the trend continues, especially across the island where I think we're going to be continuing to see these mixed type systems. And you can see where the warm air is certainly battling back across the northeast parts of the US and even Calgary at four degrees today. Now, as we look at the satellite and radar map, pretty quiet stretch here uh, to our south and west, and that is going to be the name of the game for us over the next few days, but into early next week, uh, watching some uh, pretty unsettled weather moving in. Exactly the impacts yet to be seen, but let's show you the timeline and how this will all play out. Note through this evening, the winds will taper off as that rain departs. Uh, still a little on the breezy side, certainly to start the day for tomorrow as winds are in from the west southwest. We're going to be seeing some gusts into the afternoon in the 50, 60, even 70 kilometer per hour range along that west coast. The snow does taper off, the winds slowly easing along the coast of Labrador as well. Fast forwarding now into the Friday time period, winds even lighter. But still a cool day as uh, we'll see those uh, northwesterly winds on the go, certainly easing through the day, but uh, temperatures will be cool. So as I mentioned earlier, these are your afternoon temperatures will be starting at or even above these temperatures in the morning, especially for the coast of Labrador down through Happy Valley Goose Bay, as well as the Avalon where we start near zero falling to about minus four into the afternoon. A look ahead to Friday, very similar temperatures, minus four to minus six across the island, perhaps a little bit warmer along the south coast. Chances of flurries, but some sun in the mix as well. Onshore flurries for the west coast, more sun in the mix for Labrador with a brighter day as an area of high pressure builds into your neck of the woods. Things will clear out for the island on Saturday, just as our next system on the leading edge anyway, rolls into Labrador. Some light snow with this one across the island, for Sunday, we're talking about the chance of some showers mixed with flurries. Temperatures are going to edge just above the freezing mark enough that I do think we'll see some showers mixing in for the Buren and the Avalon. This is where things get interesting for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. Forecast models are showing this uh, basically frontal boundary stalled over our neck of the woods where we could see some rain in the southeast with the potential for some snow over central and western parts of Newfoundland. The exact setup of this track and uh, and the whole weather setup overall with an area of high pressure building in the Labrador are obviously going to be key. But one of the main themes I want to hit here as we roll into the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday time period is that it does look unsettled and there's certainly some snow potential right now. The best chance appears to be for central towards western Newfoundland with I think a bit of a, a better chance of an icier uh, mix or perhaps rain here across the Avalon. At least that's where I'm leaning right now with temperatures above the freezing mark. Into Labrador, again, that snow tapers off tomorrow. Chance for some lighter snow again Saturday into Sunday, but generally a much quieter, look, quieter looking seven day uh, for you folks. Debbie? Thank you, Ryan. Well, good news if your mail is delivered to you at your home and you like it that way. The federal government says 4.2 million households will get to keep that Canada Post service, but the 840,000 who ended up with community mailboxes are out of luck. The Trudeau government outlined its plan for future mail deliveries this morning. Julie Van Dusen is following this story, joins us now from Ottawa. So Julie, how does this plan fit in with what the Liberals said leading up to their election in 2015? 
Well, Debbie, if you were following along during that campaign, uh, you may have remembered they made a promise. And if you've forgotten, we have the handy dandy campaign book here. On page 34, they promised to, well, here are the words, we will save home mail delivery. And Judy Foote, who was the minister responsible at the time and your local MP who's now stepped down, uh, she said in the House two months after the campaign that if you lost your mail delivery, you'll get it back. Now, as you mentioned in the intro, some people uh, who have it, uh, up to 4 million people, will not lose it. But those people who have those community mailboxes, well, they're out of luck. They're stuck with them. And we know, Debbie, that a lot of Canadians don't like those uh, community mailboxes because often in the winter they're frozen shut. It's hard to walk to them. Um, if you remember, Denny Coderre, the mayor of Montreal, took a, a drill to one of them and blew it up because it was too close to a park. The minister says today that uh, she's going to have uh, accessibility uh, help for people, the disabled, the elderly, who have a hard time getting to those community mailboxes, but they are here to stay. So she was asked, is this a broken promise? We'll hear what she has to say, followed by her critics, who say, indeed, it is. Basically, we're not going to put the toothpaste back in the tube. We're not, going to, we're not going to reverse these decisions that were made by the former government, but we are going to guarantee exceptional services to they were going around riding saying they were going to reverse the uh, the conservative initiative and clearly for 800,000 people in Canada that is not the case. That the Prime Minister has broken his promise to restore door-to-door -door delivery. Uh, he was clear during the election campaign that a Liberal government would restore home mail delivery to those that, who lost it uh, and it appears the government is backing away from that today. So Julie, how does the government plan, uh, plan rather to pay for this? to maintain service for over four million households. Well, that's a big challenge, and it's always the challenge. Um, and then there's the politics, of course. But the government uh, says that the good news is they have a bit of breathing space because parcel delivery is way, way up, even though uh, mail is down because a lot of people are emailing. Uh, but also, the government is putting together a new management team, and they will be tasked to look at how other countries do it, look at new technologies and so on. So their, their marching orders are to cut costs and save money, but still provide service. Julie, thanks very much for joining us with us this evening. And that is Julie Van Dusen, a welcome. senior reporter at our Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. Well, in other national and international news tonight, former U.S. gymnastics team doctor Larry Nassar has been sentenced to between 40 and 175 years for sexually molesting athletes. It came after a week of impact statements from dozens of girls and women who accused him of assault. The judge dismissed a Nassar apology to victims as insincere and castigated him severely. It is my honor and privilege to sentence you because, sir, you do not deserve to walk outside of a prison ever again. Nassar was with the U.S. team through four Olympics and also worked at Michigan State University. The minimum 40-year sentence was previously agreed to by Nassar when he pleaded guilty to seven counts of first-degree sex assault. He still faces sentencing on three other guilty pleas in another jurisdiction. And he's already serving a 60-year sentence on child pornography convictions. Well, NAFTA talks continue in Montreal today with Canada, the U.S. and Mexico meeting behind closed doors. On the agenda, some of the toughest issues, including so-called rules of origin, which will decide what percentage of the product should be made in North America. It's especially important to the automotive sector. Also on the table is the so-called sunset clause. The U.S. is pushing for the clause, which would have the NAFTA agreement expire in five years automatically, unless the three partners agree otherwise. A pretty lovely scene here, which was snapped over the weekend. Now, this caribou herd is on the island, but uh, as we know, there are only a few. So if you can guess where this picture was taken, bonus points to you, because there's not much in the way of uh, clues there, but uh, have a stab at it. I don't know where it is, but that's uh, more caribou that we have this week, and they're gorgeous. They are, <laughs> and we'll reveal where this was taken right after the break.
And uh, welcome back to Here and Now. The Norwegian Olympic curling team first became famous for their crazy pants back in Vancouver. Who can forget? They were called the Sartorial Stars of Sochi. And now they're bringing the tradition back for the third Winter Games running and shaking things up on the ice once again. They've unveiled their outfits for Pyeongchang. And here's a little preview. Lucky for us, they say if all goes well for them, they have 12 funky clothing changes to get them through the medal round. Wow. <laughs> Just another thing to look forward to as we head into the Olympic Games. <laughs> you think I can get one of those suits for the forecast? Oh, well, it looks something like your uh, Santa Claus suit, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does, but uh, you know, suit. I think that would work all winter long. Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll work on that, Ryan. <laughs> well, they're not your average neighborhood gang. The town of Edgew Edgewater, B.C., that is, has become home to almost 100 wild turkeys. Here's what one homeowner had to say about the noisy invasion. We've had turkeys in Edgewater for at least three years. Probably came to town because people were feeding them. I'm not sure if people are still feeding them, but they do a lot of damage to anybody's trees that they roost in. Wow, they roam the streets, roost in trees, and often cause property damage to yards. Oh my, the birds have become such a problem, the town is considering a bylaw that would prohibit people from feeding them. <sighs> Talk about running afoul. <laughs> I'd say, I wonder, would they be good eating? Yeah, what do you yes. think? <laughs> so, yes. Did uh, I say that? They've been in Ontario for a while, and uh, yes, yes, they are. <laughs> uh, now, have a look. Uh, our picture of the day comes to us from just north of Badger, uh, where a caribou herd is on the go. This picture was taken over the weekend. Hodges Hill caribou herd. Walt Gill snapped this beautiful shot of the caribou on the run. Well, Hodges Hill. Well, thanks a lot, Walt. Great shot. And thanks to all of you for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everyone.